David McClellan, Chief Executive of nonprofit, the non-for-profit uh, Palmy Symphony, combines bold innovation with strategic business insight that results in transformational change. With a solid reputation for helping guide small to medium mid-sized businesses and creating cultures that provide high levels of productivity and profitability, David took the helm of the Palmy Symphony in 2014 and raised its existing deficit in only one year. We then proceeded to deliver a yearly positive balance sheet and a 100% increase in revenue in five years. As subscriptions for the 2019-20 season increased by 52% from the previous year, we created the infrastructure to enable the Palm Beach Symphony to move from smaller venues to present its next full season in the two or the 2200 seat Alexander Drivers Concert Hall at Gravesheim for the performing arts. 2019 landmark moment in its 45-year-old evolution, David gained international acclaim for the symphony by appointing Gerard Schwartz as music director, the first American to be named Conductor of the Year by Musical America. Jared has seven Emmy Awards, 14 Grammy nominations, and more than 350 recordings to his credit. In addition, David has forged alliances with corporate sponsors such as Firmier Bianzo's PNC Wealth Management, Finlay Gallery, to Carl Mutel, Ned Jets, Gucci, and Lamborghini. David introduced and expanded initiatives outside the concert halls resulting in the symphony's receipt of the 2020 News Award for Outstanding Community Engagement bestowed by the Cultural Council of Palm Town. David astutely navigated the successful pivot during the COVID-19 pandemic that prohibited mass gatherings during which he championed the creation of engaging and educational online content which resulted in a 127% increase in YouTube viewership and nearly 30% growth in outside engagement. He partnered with the Creative Arts Therapies of the Palm Beaches to create a series of fun, interactive sessions for the children at Farm House and the Palm Beach Children's Hospital at St. Mary's in West Palm Beach. And he spearheaded the collaboration with Ballet Palm Beach, the Mall Theater, and Palm Beach Opera to produce an inspirational viral YouTube performance of Barry Manilow's One Voice, which was amazing, which was so moved the composer that he shared the video with his 4.4 million Facebook viewers. I don't know if you saw that, but that's incredible. If you haven't, you got to look that up on Facebook. Selected as 2020 Palm Beach Top 100, David is active in the community and currently sits on the Board of Trustees for the Palm Beach Chamber of Commerce on a panel for the Florida Department of State and Division of Cultural, Cultural Affairs, a founding board member of the Palm Beach Book Festival, and a prior board member of the Susan Coleman for the Cure and Legal Aid Society of Palm Beach County. Before I welcome David, I'm going to show a video, but please give him already, give him a big hand, David, for flying <laughs> class orchestra that performs with many of today's most acclaimed artists, Palm Beach Symphony is committed to the mission of engaging, educating, and entertaining the greater community of the Palm Beaches. A nonprofit organization and dedicated member of the community for nearly 50 years, our music education and outreach programs go beyond the concert hall to forge meaningful connections with Palm Beach County's broad and diverse population. With the support of our board, donors, and audiences, we dare to surpass previous seasons, reach higher standards of excellence, and create a vibrant and caring community. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much for this opportunity. I deeply appreciate it. Thank you to Roy, Juliza, and the rest of the board. Uh, also, Sandra, who very graciously gave us this opportunity to share with you today what we call the art of the pivot. 
So what I'd like to do over the next 30 to 45 minutes is share with you a little bit of the history of the Palm Beach Symphony starting back in 1974 when we got started, moving all the way to today, and through an accelerated manner taking you to the point where we were faced like many organizations throughout the world with how do you pivot through COVID. But before we do that, I wanted to ask if each of you could stand. I know that you just got your food, but I'm a big believer, for those of you that know me well, and I see a lot of familiar faces out in the audience, I'm a big believer in positive affirmations. I'd love to get started with one of those. Could we repeat after me, I'm alive, I'm, alive. I'm, alert. I'm alert, and I feel great. I feel great. Okay, one more time, ready? I'm alive, I'm, alive. I'm alert, I'm alert. And, I and I feel great. Perfect, thank you. So by a show of hands, how many of you are in business in this room? Okay, that's almost everybody. How many of you are in sales? You might have caught on to the question. <laughs> it was 1974, as I'd mentioned, Palm Beach Symphony was founded. At the time, gas prices were 53 cents. Gerard Ford was president. Nixon had just been given the boot. And some of the, the funny slang, I went back and looked at this and I thought it was sort of funny. Psych, right? Far out. Dream on. That was 1974 when we got started. In the earliest days, we were a very small organization that performed mostly in people's homes. And it wasn't really until Ethel Stone became the symphony's board chair, a position that she held for 22 years, that the symphony really started to become established as a cultural institution in our community. Upon her death in August of 1996, John and Joan Tighe stepped in to continue her legacy. They established a stable board of directors, a dedicated administrative staff, and a very small endowment to ensure the symphony's continued growth. It was in 2004, if we look back on the history of our 48 years, that we realized what some of the influential people and things were that get us to this point. What I did not put in the slide is Dr. Ray Robinson. For those of you that are familiar with Dr. Ray Robinson, he came to the helm of the Palm Beach Symphony in 2004, stayed at the helm as managing director, conductor, music director until 2010. Ray was truly the one that laid the foundation for the Palm Beach Symphony to get to be the level that we are today. In 2008, a gentleman by the name of Dale McNulty joins the board. Believe it or not, at that time in 2008, Palm Beach Symphony performed solely on the island of Palm Beach. There's 1.5 million people who live in Palm Beach County. Palm Beach County is a very vast county. And yet, the fact that there's 1.5 million people that live in Palm Beach County, in a big county, they performed only on Palm Beach. Dale's vision was to go across the bridge. Believe it or not, it's sort of hard to imagine that. That his vision was, why don't we go across the bridge? There's this tiny performing arts center called the Kravis Center. And maybe we could go perform there. So it was really Dale that started this vision. And you're going to hear me talk a lot about vision. It's one of the seven principles for success that we have. 2014, as Michael said, I joined the team at the Palm Beach Symphony after serving 15 amazing years, serving in a wide variety of positions at Bear Lakes Country Club. I had the fortune of being at the Loggerhead Marine Life Center for two and a half years. And in 2014, joined the team at the Palm Beach Symphony. Day one, I walk in, there's one employee. I say to the one employee, may I see a copy of the budget? She says, of course. She brings me a manila folder that has ledger paper with pencils and pens and numbers everywhere. After 40 years in business, no budget. And this is not unnormal for nonprofits, so we're not picking on any of the previous administration. This is the nonprofit world. Prior year to my arrival, we lost $175,000 on a $700,000 budget. So that's 20% of revenue was gone. When we did the forward cash flow projections, because Mrs. Bach, Dora Bach, gave us a million dollar gift many years prior to that, unfortunately, because of tough economic times in 2008, 2009, 2010, that million dollars was drawn down to $100,000. So day one, no budget. Welcome to the Palm Beach Symphony. Let's get started, right? Where do we begin? Well, obviously, the first thing that we did is we had to put together very tight financial controls. We had to establish a budget put together a finance committee, make sure that all the people around the board were engaged, and we had to do all those things concurrently. That leads us to 
what we believe are the seven principles of success, and especially as it relates to the history of the Palm Beach Symphony and how we were able to get where we are today. Number one is the bus. How many of you have read the phenomenal book, Good to Great? Quite a few of you. So all of you that have read that book know that Jim Collins talks about the most important thing in business is to get all the right people on the bus, but then more importantly is to get all the right people that are on the bus seated in the right position. So the first thing that we had to do was embark on what they call the three P's. And I had a great conversation with Wayne Canner the other morning. Where's Wayne? Right there, who spent 40 years at GE. The three P's sort of comes from the old methodology of total quality management, which has sort of morphed into now Six Sigma. The three P's, you'll hear Marcus talk about it on The Profit, is people, process, and product. It does not matter what industry any of you are in, those are the three most important things you need. In the book, he also talks about if you're going to launch a company, it's first who, and then it's what. So you've got to identify the right people. Steve Jobs talks about surrounding himself with people that are smarter than him and allowing them to tell him what to do. That's sort of our methodology. I have a team of people that are seated at this table right here that are the most brilliant people that I am so blessed to work with, and we'll get to that more later. The Nordstrom Way, one of my favorite books. You're going to hear me talk about that a lot. One of my favorite books, one of my favorite books. I say that very often, which I know the staff is probably sick of me saying. Um, one of my favorite books is The Nordstrom Way. Why? Because in The Nordstrom Way, they asked Mr. Nordstrom, how did you build Nordstrom to be this phenomenal organization? He said, it's really simple. I hired the smile. So think about that with people as you're building your teams, as you're trying to establish culture. It's first who, then what. Hiring the smile, making sure you're surrounding yourself with people bigger, better, smarter than you, and allowing them to tell you what to do. So if you think about our organization, how have we been able to get here? Michael was very gracious in the bio that he read. That bio is only possible because of our board, because of the people that provide the time, the talent, and the treasure to support this amazing organization. It's people like Gerard Schwartz, who we were so blessed to have take the helm as music director two and a half years ago, as they said, has seven Emmys, 14 um, Grammy nominations. It's people like Olga Vasquez, who's our director of education and orchestral management, who has taken the organization to being able to educate 50,000 Palm Beach County students in recent years. It's people like Julia Selchuk, yes, applaud for that. When we talk about Hire the Smile, we did a concert at Benjamin Hall because, believe it or not, three or four years ago, we were performing at Bethesda by the Sea. That was our big Masterworks concert, Bethesda by the Sea, 500 people, 20 musicians on the stage, Masterworks, right? To fast forward to today, doing Beethoven 9 with 80 musicians, 120 singers in the Kravis Center. We, I will get to the gala in a second, grew our gala from zero five years ago to one million dollars prior to COVID because of people like Julia Selchuk, who was Hire the Smile. We hosted a concert at Benjamin Hall. She decided she wanted to come and volunteer. Who's the first person I see? Moment of truth. If any of you have studied the Ritz-Carlton books, I walk into the door. Who's the first person I say? Good afternoon, Mr. McClymont. How are you? Please come right in. So I immediately said, wow, Hire the Smile. We hired her. <laughs> <laughs> Sage just joined us from the Kravis Center and box office. She's our patron relations concierge. Katrina, who was instrumental in this event. She put all the packages on the tables last night. She helped put together the packages. She made it as our social media. She just graduated from Palm Beach Atlantic and has taken us by storm. Felix Riviera. Felix manages our Young Friends group. He manages our Swings for Strings. He manages our expanding membership program and all of our corporate support with some of the people like Meg Enriquez, who's in here from HSS. Mike Pumo from Sinclair, who I know is in here. So Felix has been with us, I guess, about six years, seven years, right? So it's the team. The other thing I should say, too, citing no authority, right? I'm not standing up here to tell you something you don't already know. When I was going through this presentation, I think it was a great reminder that sometimes we just have to go back to the principles. And maybe we lose sight of those. Number two is culture. I am a huge student of culture. I spent 15 amazing years managing a private Jack Nicholas Country Club, Bear Lakes Country Club, two signature Jack Nicholas design courses, 36,000 square foot facility, 
phenomenal social program, great membership, and you quickly learn how important culture is. What is culture? Well, according to Gallup, which creates the Q12, and I strongly encourage any of you that want to learn more about Gallup, look at the Q12. The Q12 is exactly what it says. It's 12 questions. But those 12 questions will determine, almost like the thermostat that's in this room, the culture within your organization as it relates to engagement. Listen to these metrics, and these are current metrics. Currently, 36% of US employees are engaged in their work and their workplace. If we were to flip that, because that's actually the optimistic way of saying it, it would be 64% of the workforce in the United States of America are disengaged. So do you think culture is important? If you look at the number worldwide, globally, it's 20% of employees are engaged. Conversely, 80% are disengaged. So culture is critical. When you look at your organizations, when you look at the organizations you work for, the teams that you manage, what are your customer service standards? Think about, what are they? Are they defined? Do you have them? Does the organization communicate them? I put two examples because it's two of my favorite companies. The Ritz-Carlton, which is very easy to pick on, um, has done a phenomenal job since 1986, founded in Atlanta, Georgia, grew leaps and bounds, the Marriott buys them out. One of the stories I had about the Ritz was I love to do triathlons. I entered a triathlon, I went down to Key Biscayne. When I called up the Ritz to say, hey, listen, I'd like to stay at the Ritz-Carlton, they said, wonderful. When will you be arriving? I told them. What kind of a car will you be driving? I told them, not realizing where this was going. A couple more questions they asked in a really beautiful way, not to where I felt like I was being interrogated or investigated. Next thing you know, I show up to the Ritz-Carlton at the security gate. Mr. McClymont, welcome to the Ritz-Carlton of Key Biscayne. We understand you're going to be competing in the triathlon tomorrow. We're going to wish you luck. I want you to go see Brett. He's at the front door. I understand you have a bicycle. We have storage for the bicycle. After you see Bruce, make sure you go see Jenny, because Jenny's going to take you to your room. I still tell that story. That happened 10 years ago. I still tell the story. How many of you shopped at, uh, at, uh, dined at Chick-fil-A? Yeah. What's one of the things, and Katrina, you can't say this because she used to work there. What's one of the things they say? <laughs> say it again? <laughs> and we could probably criticize it and say, gosh, they say it so much. Right? They say it to ad nauseum. But I don't know. <laughs> I took my son for the first time in who knows how long, because it was very late and it was the only place to eat at <coughs> McDonald's the other night. And I did not get a my pleasure. <laughs> Sorry if any of you have Publix or uh, McDonald's stock. Above and beyond, what are your above and beyond stories? What are you doing every single day within your customer base to try to create those moments of truth, those magic moments, the above and beyond stories? We'll get to a couple of those in a minute that our team has actually created. This one I love, the inverted triangle. How many of you know what the inverted triangle means? The inverted triangle means that traditionally the old hierarchy of management was that everything is driven from the top down. So I'm CEO of the Palm Beach Symphony, you do what I say, my decisions are the best decisions, and just go get it done, right? The culture that we have created with this amazing group of people that I'm blessed to work with is that it's actually inverted, which means I invite them to tell me all the reasons why I'm wrong. And then you have discovery. And it saves you as an organization from going down paths that you shouldn't be going down. So I invite you to look at your organizations and ask the question, do you have the inverted triangle as it relates to culture? Are you inviting your teams to be open, to be critical? and to share their constructive criticism like our team does. We have some really heated discussions on our Thursday staff meeting at 2 o'clock. And do they love to tell me that I'm wrong? And 90% of the time, they're right. Appearance, again, so basic, right? Appearance. What has happened to us? When I used to work at Bear Lakes, my uniform was a pair of khaki pants, a pair of tennis shoes, and a golf shirt. Pretty basic, right? It was pretty amazing how bad people could mess that up. <laughs> From the khakis being stained, maybe the pleats weren't done, the shoes were dirty, the golf shirt didn't have the crease down the side. When I worked at Loggerhead, same exact thing. We used to wear a pair of khaki pants. I had a golf shirt. It wasn't a nice suit like I'm wearing today. Appearance. My dad was a very accomplished baseball player and hockey player. He played hockey for the Junior A Canadians, so he coached me in baseball. One of the things that he drilled into my head was dress the part, act the part, 
be the part. And I can't emphasize this enough. I think we as organizations, something's happened where we've become very lax. And the point I made about Bear Lakes and Loggerhead and now at the symphony where I have to dress up in suits, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. It matters in the way that you're presenting yourself. What are you as an organization doing to separate yourself? What is your differentiating value proposition? What separates you? If I go through the room and I look at some of the people who are in here in different industries and I know the industries that you're in, the realtors, the attorneys, the clothiers, Bob and Rick, the ones that style people. If you were to sit in front of somebody, are you able to clearly say what your differentiating value proposition is that separates you from the pack? Empowerment. I'm a huge believer in empowerment. One of the things that I say when I hire is, and I get asked this question a lot when we hire, Mr. McClyman, what is your management style and your culture? And I say, I'm so glad you asked that question. And I think the team would support me when I say this. What I say to everybody is, this is my management style. We have to get from here to LA by next Friday at 10 AM. You can't break the law. I'll see you next Friday at 10 AM. I don't like to micromanage. And I've learned that when you micromanage, you're actually hindering people's performance. So our team, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll give you an example. Felix played golf yesterday at Bear Lakes. I saw it on the calendar. I went to him and I said, how dare you go play golf without me? <laughs> right? I don't know that Olga has been in the office for a couple weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and I don't care. Right? Because our team knows that they have to get to LA by next Friday at 10. And that's all that matters. But they can't break the law. And that's where you get into ethics. Right? So I always say, if you want to take a hot air balloon, go for it. If you want a skateboard, good for you. If you want a rollerblade, if you want to go to Montreal first, I don't care what you do. Just get to LA by Friday at 10 AM. And that analogy is production. So you have to produce. That leads us to what we created when I was at Loggerhead Marine Life Center. I had an amazing gentleman by the name of Barry Crook. And I've had some phenomenal mentors in my career. He was one of them. He worked at Weyerhaeuser for 30 years. He was a Harvard grad. And I guess he took a liking to me. He saw my work ethic. And he said, listen, I'm going to work with you to show you something that we did at Weyerhaeuser that's called the one page strategic plan. And any of you have read the Rockefeller Habits, he sort of created that, right? We customized it and made it our own. It is so basic, but so powerful. It's mission. Does your organization have a mission? If so, are you asking the two questions, is it relevant? And are you living up to it? Do you have a vision? Now, this is where it gets really amazing. Do you have core values? Do you have cultural behaviors? And then last, do you have strategies? Let me show you how this works. When I was at Loggerhead Marine Life Center, we had a board of about 25 people, all of which were highly educated, all of which were really opinionated, all of which were really smart and successful. And they would come with ideas that were well intended. I think that we should set up a Ferris wheel. That was actually one of the real ideas at Loggerhead. Because when people come, they'll be able to go up in the Ferris wheel and see the beaches that we protect and then see the turtles, right? If you have this document, anytime something comes to you within your organization, you can do two things. If it's board or if it's staff, you can say, help me understand where that fits within our one page strategic plan. Do you see what governs the organization then? It separates the personality. It's not David McClymont's decision, my beliefs, my philosophies. It's not a board member's. It goes back to that one page strategic plan. If any of you would like to get more information on that, email me and I'll share it with you. I'll actually show you ours. Number three, this was a very big part of how we were able to go, as they said in the introduction, from really zero to 60. We were able to erase the deficit within one year. I mentioned this metric before. There's 1.5 million people that live in Palm Beach County, thereabouts. After 40 years in business, 1.5 million people that live in Palm Beach County, 2,000 people in constituent database. 1.5 billion people, target market, 2,000 people. Right? Average age of the 2,000 people, 78 years old. So here's my iPhone. If I was Steve Jobs and I was trying to sell iPhones for $1,000, and I had, of the 330 million people in the United States of America, I had 2,000 in my constituent database, my target market that I was listening to, and the average age was 78, do you think I would sell phones? <laughs> right? We're dead in the water. So one of the first things that we did with Felix's help was we grew that to 45,000 people. 
So now we have 45,000 people in our constituent database, and they are profiled, segmented. They're everything that we need within the organization. Average age, I think, is about 62. Felix might correct me on this, but the last time I looked at it, it was about 62. So what did we do? We grew critical mass. So those of you that are in business, look at your database. How big is your database? Is your database clean? Meaning that the people are in there, are they really people that have an affinity and a propensity to support your product or service? I can't emphasize that enough because it's quality over quantity. If that was 45,000 and it was a bunch of people that lived in Miami that hated classical music, would the 45,000 be of value, right? So you have to have quality. Data mining. There are so many tools out there right now for every single one of you, regardless of what your industry is, for you to figure out how you can grow your critical mass and how you can figure out how you can get closer to targeting people. Where's Mike Pumo? And I'm going to pick on people. Mike Pumo, general manager of Sinclair, and we'll get to the importance of relationships here in a second. I had the opportunity last night to sit down with Mike for a drink, and we were talking about data, and we were talking about targeting people. They're a shining example. A lot of people think that Sinclair is CBS 12, right? Hi, CBS 12, TV. He corrected me last night. He said, David, it's not TV. It's video. I said, say that again, Mike? He said, David, it's not TV. It's video. So the reason I pick on him is because there's organizations like Sinclair that have all of these tools available to where you within your organizations can go to Mike and his team and figure out your strategies on how are you going to target those people. iWave. iWave is nothing more than a wealth engine software platform. It's very much like, uh, I think wealth engine is one of them. It's a wealth search platform. We made the investment. And this is really interesting. We made the investment at a time where we couldn't make the investment. We didn't have the money. We were losing money. And I went to the board and I said, we have to make an investment. And it was pretty steep. It was about four or $5,000 for the subscription. I think that's about right, Felix, isn't it? It's four or five grand. But what iWave did was it allowed us to better analyze the 45,000 people that were in that database so we could then tier them. Because obviously, as a small organization, we can't manage 45,000 people. It's great to have that many people but it goes back to the top 1%. You've got to manage that top 1%. iWave gave us the tools to figure out how to manage the top 1%. Data drives decisions. I say this all the time. Mar Maria, who is the owner of our PR firm, Pearson Grant, who has done an amazing, amazing job, and a very big part of why we are where we are today is because she manages all the PR with Savannah. I say it to them all the time. Data drives decisions. How did the data drive decisions in the early days? We did an analysis of the mission. I think that every single nonprofit should look at two things when they look at the mission. Number one, I said it earlier, is your mission relevant? Things change. Things evolve, right? Just like we saw with the 1974 slide. Is your mission relevant? Secondly, are you living up to it? Needs analysis. First thing that we did once we realized that yes, the mission was relevant, yes, we were not living up to it, was we had to figure out where were the needs within Palm Beach County to be able to fulfill those needs to live up to the mission. One of the things that we weren't living up to was the education. So our mission is to engage, educate, and entertain. Think about those three pillars, right? We want to engage. This is part of it right now. I'm engaging you. I hope that you come to one of our concerts. That would be amazing, right? I want to educate you. We're going to get to that in the end of the presentation. And we want to educate. So we did an analysis. What are we doing to educate? Take a while, guess what the answer was. What would you like on your bagel? Zero. Nothing. So here we have a mission that says to engage, educate, and entertain. We weren't doing anything. Nothing. But then, before we embarked on trying to go take over Palm Beach County, right? let's go embark on a campaign and fix all the problems of education, we had to know where is the need. So we went directly to the superintendent and we said, help us understand where the real needs are. They sent back a list after about six months of going through this needs analysis. The conservatory school at North Palm Beach needed a cello. Belvedere Elementary School had 20 brand new violins, nobody to teach them. And the more we started seeing it, we started realizing this is low hanging fruit. We can go out and immediately start to make a difference with this. Another thing we did, and I didn't put this book in here, but it's one of my favorite books. I said it again. Start with why, Simon Sinek. How many of you have read that book or watched his YouTube? So one of the things that we did that was critical in the early stages, and I share this with you too for any of you that work in nonprofit or if you work with boards, sit down with your board or your investors, ask why. Why are you here? 
What is your why? If Roy was sitting on my board, I would want to sit down with coffee and say to Roy, why are you here? When you ask that question, the most amazing answers are given to you. I'll give you a case in point. We had a board member when I first started that some of our board had said, I think he should not be on the board. He doesn't do anything, he doesn't give, he's awful. Get him off the board. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll take that under advisement. I appreciate your concern. I'll get back to you. I went and sat down with the gentleman. I asked him his why. He said, my why is because my mom was a concert pianist. And all I can remember about my mom was my mom playing piano. And that's why I support you, and that's why I want to be a part of your organization. This individual that we were told wouldn't support, shouldn't be on the board, has gone from zero to 50,000 per year. Because we asked the why. So ask the why. Measure what matters. Data drives decisions. Measure what matters. Another great book, Measure What Matters by John Doerr. John Doerr spent a whole bunch of time at Intel. All of a sudden, he pulled the parachute. He went out and opened up a private equity firm. You guys can look him up on YouTube, watch his videos. Measure what matters. How many of you are familiar with a doctor? Do you know what a doctor is? How many of you have been to a doctor? OK, you have. That's good. Um, <laughs> When you went to the doctor, did they do something called vitals? When you go to the doctor, do they take your vitals? Yes. I'm sorry, say it. Yes. Oh, okay, just checking. <laughs> your organization's vitals are your data. So think about your health. If you go and they take your blood pressure and they test your cholesterol and all these different things, we have to have that same methodology as to our organizations because our organizations are living, breathing entities if you manage them accordingly. And they have blood pressure and they have cholesterol. So what kind of data charts do you have? Do you have flash reports? Do you have dashboards? Do you have balanced scorecards? Do you have anything? It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter the formality. Think about your key metrics. And are you studying those on a daily basis? We sit down every single Thursday at 2 p.m. We talk about the KPIs. And we hone in on those KPIs. Conversion. How much did we invest to market on a particular campaign? What was the ROI on that campaign? What was the conversion? How many subscriptions do we have, Sage? Right. How, how many are new? How many are organic? How many are converts? How many are laps? Study your data. I cannot emphasize this enough. Data is everything. It's the new currency. Metrics and KPIs, it's the same thing. So <clears throat> if you read the book Measure What Matters, John gets into the OKRs, which are objectives and key results. It's another fancy way of saying KPIs, key performance indicators. It doesn't matter which way you skin it. Just make sure that your organization has some type of a dashboard so that as you're going through every single day of every single week trying to chase the goal of what you're looking to achieve, you are measuring what matters. Does that make sense? This one I love. So before I worked at Bear Lakes, I had the pleasure of working in the investment banking world. I worked for UBS in Fort Lauderdale. And we had a sales training class with a gentleman by the name of Tom Hopkins. How many of you have heard of Tom Hopkins? That's good, because he's actually sort of old school, like 90s and 2000s. Tom Hopkins is arguably the most successful real estate agent, or one of, ever. He is a phenomenal sales trainer. In his video, How to Master the Art of Selling, he talks about, again, a principle. God gave you two ears and one mouth. Use them in direct proportion. What does that mean? That means listen twice as much, right? Why is that important? I'll tell you why it's important. Because that same donor that I was talking about, that now gives us 50000 I had a conversation with three months ago. And she just told me, out of the whim, because I had called her in the middle of her watching HBO with the Bee Gees, David, I have to call you back. I said, OK, no problem. She said, I'm watching the Bee Gees. Bye, click. <laughs> so think about that morsel. That was a morsel. What do you think I did? I went onto Amazon and I found a $100 gorgeous coffee table book of the Bee Gees and I sent it to her. Because you listen. Lactose intolerant. This is one of my favorite stories and I'm going to pick on Olga. Olga at the time was really focused on operations. This is before she grew the education component from zero to 50,000 Palm Beach County students. We're sitting at Cafe Balloud. I don't know if you guys can see this. One of our new donors. Only a subscriber, has huge potential to become even more than that. Sits down, they deliver the dessert, all of a sudden. So 
sort of dramatic, pushes away the dessert. Olga notices it, almost like I'm looking at this entire room now. Somehow she noticed it. She went up to the gentleman and she said, is everything okay? And he said, I can't have this. I'm lactose intolerant. She said, okay, let me see if I can do something for you. She went back, talked to the chef. She got almost the exact same dessert, lactose intolerant. That individual five years ago went from being a subscriber, now being on our board, and just underwrote an entire concert to the tune of $100,000. So I tell you these stories because there's connectivity with the two ears to one mouth. Just listen. <laughs> and then it was sort of funny, the next time that he came, right, Olga was sort of standing off to the side like, I dare you to push it away. Well, I double dare you to push it away, right? Because she knew that the same dessert that was sitting at the table was lactose intolerant. Small, small little things, right? We've all heard ABCs. Always be closing. A lot of you in this room are very good at that. I will say that. I don't think Bob's here, right? Goldfarb? Today? He's amazing. He really is. He's, he, I just think he's the epitome of always be closing. He's always closing. He's trying to fit me with everything. He's trying to put my kids into suits, <laughs> right? And my animals I don't have. He's like, listen, we get the dog suited up, kangaroo. <clears throat> I'm like, Bob, maybe just start with me. <clears throat> How many of you take vitamins? Okay. So the vitamins with Tom Hopkins are application, believability, compassion, determination, and enthusiasm. It is so important. Can you imagine if you're going out on a sales call, and you guys all agree, that's why I asked that loaded question, who's in sales, and I'm so glad most of you raised your hand. Every single one of you are in sales. Let me remind that to you. I don't care if you're an attorney or an engineer, you're in sales, because you're trying to sell your product or service. Another thing he says, watch this video. He talks about if somebody asks you how's business, it's unbelievable. Now what he says in the video, which is hilarious, is that if business is really bad, it's still unbelievable. It's really bad, right? If it's phenomenal, it's still unbelievable. There's nothing worse than when you ask somebody, Roy, how's business? <laughs> Right? And people just dump on you with, like, I lost a client, flat tire. No, it's unbelievable. Value proposition. I had the great fortune to go to Michigan State to get certified in a business certification. One of my professors was Bonnie Knudsen. Bonnie Knudsen was the one that advised Coca-Cola on branding. And she said to us in the class, she said, I want all of you to understand something. Value proposition is actually a mathematical formula. It's not a marketing formula. It's in math. It's in the math department. The mathematical formula is the V equals P over E, which means your value is your price divided by your experience. That's what separates you. And that's why we're able to get donors that came in as subscribers and graduate to 100,000 because their value proposition of what we provide beyond the world-class music with Valentin and Annabelle is beyond. Competitive advantage, we talked about that. Try to really determine and analyze what separates you from the pack. What is your competitive advantage? You all have one. And if you don't know what it is, really do some discovery to try to figure out what it is. Reduction to the ridiculous, I love this one. You guys have probably heard this before. Tom talks about it a lot. Let's just say that Gil Walsh, who's an amazing interior designer, is with a client, and the difference is about $5,200 between David McClymont, the not-so-good interior designer that they love, and Gil Walsh, the really amazing interior designer. The reduction to the ridiculous is to take the 5200 and break it over 12 months. And you just divide it. It's 100 a week. When she sits down with the client, Mrs. Jones, I just want to showcase for you that what we're really talking about right here is it's $100 a week. Make sense? This is another great one, dead ops topsy report. How many of you have actually lost clients or deals or business or whatever? Raise your hands. Everyone's like this. <laughs> okay. The dead autopsy report is exactly what it says. If somebody passes away, what does the coroner's office do? They go in and analyze how did this person perish to better understand for future, right? I highly recommend for all of you that are in sales, do dead autopsy reports on all of your lost sales so you can learn. But then the windshield to the rearview mirror is a great ratio. <clears throat> Use the windshield to the rearview mirror in direct proportion to their size. Meaning, when you reflect on the dead autopsy report, about 10, 20% of your reflection should be in that rear view mirror for the dead autopsy of how you lost the client, and the other 80% should be forging ahead through that windshield, driving on to your next goal, your next opportunity. 
Data mining and segmentation, this is something I think is very, very important that Felix has done a phenomenal job with. We still have a long way to go, and that's why we're working with people like Mike Pumo at Sinclair. Manage your data, data drives decisions, but really understand your data. Can you imagine if we sent out a mailer to all 45,000 people saying, come on down to the Tchaikovsky Five concert at the Kravis Center. And we didn't determine if they even like Tchaikovsky or if they like classical music. Do you know that we actually have donors that donate money to us and don't attend anything? <laughs> they just believe in the mission. So why would we spend all of that time trying to target them on something that they could care less about? We have donors that only care about the education. Paul Goldner. He was one of the ones in the first six months that I started the Palm Beach Symphony. I went to Paul Goldner. I said, here's the needs. You had told me with your why. What is your why? The why was, David, if you find a need in education, I will fund it. He gave us 25000 That 25000 he challenged us to get another twenty five. Now it's fifty. Know your data and know your segmentation. So you're speaking to their affinity. Relationship building. I am a big believer, for those of you that know me in this room, Kelly, uh, with relationships. And case in point, Kelly did a travel, and can I pick on you? Yeah. Okay, all right. So travel, uh, Kelly owns a PR firm. And Kelly's clients are Magellan Jets and IYC Yachts. And Kelly said, hey, I have this unbelievable journalist with Travel and Leisure Magazine. She's amazing. And she wants to actually do a story, and she had about 90% of it formulated brilliantly, to fly up to Hilton Head, and bring the CEO of, of IYC and some other people and make it look like what it would be like if we all had the pleasure of flying on private planes on Magellan. We partnered, did we not? I didn't gain anything out of it. But then again, did I? Right? I wasn't compensated. There was no monetary exchange. So I firmly believe try to give far more than you get, and I promise you, you will get far more than you could ever ask for. But to do it, you have to be genuine. You have to be altruistic. You have to believe in paying it forward. This is something that our team does. Hooli will drive to people's houses to like take out their garbage. I mean, it just surprises me. Like I'll talk to donors and they'll go, that Julia, she's so sweet. She came over to our house yesterday, took out all of our garbage. I'm like, Julia, are you working for waste management now? Like, what are you doing? So pay it forward, law of attraction. We started off with the law of attraction. I'm a big student of that. People can be critical of it and think differently than what I think of it. I just think you put positive thoughts in your head, positive things are going to happen. It's not guaranteed, but I can promise you it's better than sitting here and saying, I'm not alive, I'm not alert, and I don't feel good. Right? And then how are you adding value to each and every day, both personally and to the people that you surround yourself with? Visioning, I love this. Believe it or not, day one, 2014, Palm Beach Symphony had hosted an annual dinner dance at the Flagler Museum for 10 years. They raised $100,000, and they spent $100,000 <laughs> for 10 years. So we decided with the team, I went into the board. This was one of the 10 times I was actually fired within the first year. Um, and I said to the board, we're either canceling the dinner dance or we're turning it into a gala. You can't do that. I said, that's the decision. Canceling it, turning it into a gala. It went from zero to raising a million dollars pre-COVID. So in 2000, February 2020, Julia and the amazing team that I have the pleasure of working with raised just under $1 million at the Breakers Hotel. Innovation, in the early days, maybe some of you, <clears throat> maybe some of you have actually seen this video. This is another hilarious, this was one of the 10 times I was fired. Um, our beloved board president who passed away just recently, who we miss dearly, was so phenomenal to work with because he was difficult, demanding, visionary, but he was a little bit open and willing to take a risk. So our fearless leader, Rena Blades, who was CEO of the Cultural Council, calls up the Palm Beach Symphony because I had known her when I was CEO at the Loggerhead Marine Life Center. David, I have what I think is a really good idea. Will you participate? I said, sure, Rena, what is it? She said, we have a rapper that's actually going to be performing as a secret at the Governor's Conference at the Boca Resort in front of 3,000 people. We'd love to do a mashup with the symphony and the ballet. I said, I'm all over it, right? Because I love creativity. I love innovation. I knew it was risky. I knew we were going to get criticism with people that are at the table like Olga and Felix, who are brilliant musicians and composers and everything else. What are we doing partnering with a rapper? 
But I knew what we needed to do at that time because we had 2,000 people in the constituent database, 1.5 million people, we had to do a cannonball in the pool. So we went down and started rehearsing with Vanilla Ice, <laughs> which is now the video that has 50,000 views, right? But this is what's so funny. I would come back and I would speak to Dale, and Dale would say, how did the rehearsal go with iced tea? <laughs> and I said, Dale, um, we have a couple problems here. First of all, it's not iced tea, the wrapper, and it's not iced tea with lemon. It's vanilla ice. Yeah, you know what I mean. That guy, right? So innovation. As you guys are going throughout your careers with your industries and your jobs, really try to be innovative. The ladies' tea. The Ladies' Guild, bless their hearts, 25 amazing, dynamic, committed ladies for, was it 10 years, Julia? 10 years? 10 years, they would go to the Chesterfield Hotel, and they would put on some lovely hats, and they would have a tea. And they would plan for six months for the tea, and it would raise $2,500. <laughs> so that was maybe the ninth time I was fired. I came in and I said, we're canceling the tea, and we're either going to turn it into a fundraising luncheon, or we're getting rid of it. We turn it into the Holly Jolly, which is sold out at the Beach Club in December, which raises $250,000 for educational outreach, which is managed by Julia. We already talked about the gala and, the, and how we were able to sort of grow and scale the gala from zero about six years ago to a million dollars. One of my favorite books. 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. Two things that stick out in that book. One, the law of navigation. I think it was an expedition that happened in 1918. Don't hold me to that. It was somewhere around there. Two people that went on an expedition. One had horses because the person thought that they would actually make it there faster. The horses would be stronger. The other one had the traditional dogs. What do you think happened? Unfortunately, the horses died, and I think almost everybody died in the book. The other thing that stuck out in that book was John Lasseter. How many people know that name? John Lasseter is the guy that created Pixar. And if you read the book, for seven years, he forged trying to create Pixar. Pixar, Toy Story, Cars, right? And kept failing, kept failing, kept failing. He got to the point where it was the brink, where in year seven, he said, I'm done. I'm cashing in the towel. The rest is sort of history. So visioning is extremely important. That gets us to, and I want to make sure that I'm good with time, and I'll go through this quickly. How did we navigate COVID? And all of this sort of comes to a head with these seven things right here. We were riding a wave of success. Box office sales were through the ceiling. Olga and her team were exploding all kinds of metrics with education. Raised a million dollars at the gala. Raised $200,000 at Holly Jolly. Membership was up. We were riding a wave of success. March 13 happens. We're at the Beach Club concluding a planned giving seminar. And we come back, and I don't have to tell you the rest. You guys know the rest. <clears throat> what did we do? We mobilized. I can't emphasize this enough. Mobilization is exactly what we talked about in the beginning with Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs wants to make sure he surrounds himself with people that are bigger, better, smarter than him and let them tell him what to do. We sat down with the team. We sat down with our board. We sat down with our maestro. And we said, how do we persevere? How do we persevere? Because we're not going away. That was not even a question. What we realized was that data drives decisions. So we surveyed the 45,000 people. We have three options. One is to go away and do nothing, to crawl in a cave, or to create a hybrid, or to forge ahead. So we let the data drive the decisions. You know what the data said? 66% of the people said, do not go away. You are far too important for the community. You donated 50 instruments last year to kids in Palm Beach County that need them. Who will donate those instruments if you go away? You can't go away. Don't go away. So we let the data give us the support to then go into the board and say, I'm not making this decision. The data is making the decision. Then, this is a great sales thing. We asked the big, scary question. When I realized that we couldn't do the holly jolly at the beach club, I had to figure out how we pivoted. I called up Liz Carantes, who's the news anchor at CBS 12. Is Mike still here? Good, I want to pick on him again. Um, and I asked her the big question. I said, Liz, listen, you've emceed the Holly Jolly for the last four years. I have a huge question, and I'm not going to take no. And she said, oh. <laughs> I said, I want to do a televised TV concert on Sinclair on CBS 12. She said, David, David, David. <laughs> That's a pretty big ask. I said, I know. I told you that. I'm asking a big ask. I want to make it happen. We need to do this. We have to figure out how we can continue to persevere. She said, all right, let me run it up the flagpole. I'll introduce you to Brent. If you're lucky, you'll get to talk to Mike Pumo. We didn't do one. 
We did one. And Mike, correct me if I'm wrong with these metrics. We did one, first place in the time slot. First place. Sounds of the season holiday concert. First place in the time slot. We get a phone call from Mike's team. He says, this was so unbelievable. Would you mind if we actually ran it again? We're going to put you in prime time up against It's a Wonderful Life. I said, why would you do that? We're going to get killed. Let's just beta test it, right? We missed getting one in the number one time slot for prime time by 0.2 against It's a Wonderful Life. We wanted to do six more. And in September, we're going to be recording again Sounds of the Seas, not just for this December, but for next December. And we're actually also going to be doing a July 4th concert. So Mike, thank you to you and your team at Sinclair. And with these last two, I'll sort of close. So this was what was really critical for us. Answer the objection in advance of the objection. Answer the objection in advance of the objection. Try to identify what those objections will be. Going back to the value proposition, here was our challenge. We have a very strong membership base. It's about 105 people. They spend anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000 per year. That revenue is at risk to be gone because part of the value proposition, value equals price divided by experience, was that part of their membership is to go to all five Masterworks concerts and then go to these very private, very intimate, amazing dinners at Cafe Baluch, don't tell anybody, the Breakers, shh, don't tell anybody. That's gone. So now when we as a team are calling up Mrs. Jones saying, listen, we'd love to get your $10,000 donation this year to support our mission because the data drives decisions and everyone's saying we should continue, they said, but what about the dinners? And we said, we're so glad you asked because we had a solution to it. We knew that they were going to ask that. Answer the objection and advance the objection. What we did, because we believe in partnerships, we went to three of the most amazing restaurants that we partner with. 1000 North and Jupiter, we wanted to be strategic. All of the owners, not all of them, but most of them are donors to the symphony. Cafe Chardonnay and Palm Beach Gardens. And the Colony Hotel, which was one of the official hotels of the Palm Beach Symphony. We said, will you help us create the solutions to answer the objection in advance of the objection? What do you have in mind? We want to create three choices. One, they can drive by and pick it up, if that's what they choose. Two, we'll deliver it to their doorstep. Three, they can actually go in and dine outside. Is that okay with you? Done. Now we call up Mrs. Jones and say, Mrs. Jones, we had already shown them how to watch t the concerts on TV, thanks to Mike and his team. Um, and now they're just eating their dinners in their home, watching the concerts. So does that make sense? Impact. I love to tell this story, and I'm so glad that we have Annabelle. Um, two amazing stories, and I brag about this all the time. Valentina Pellucci, Annabelle's older sister. Valentina Pellucci is a student at Dreyfus School of the Arts. She's playing on a violin. She auditions for our Lisa B. Bruna, Lisa Bruna B. Major Award, which is an award that, thanks to Olga and her creativity and her vision, she has created. They are high-level instruments. They're $7,000, $10,000, $12,000 instruments for students that want to matriculate and go on to conservatories and universities. Valentina auditions for six universities and conservatories throughout the United States of America. Correct me if I'm wrong with these. Um, New England Conservatory, tiny school called Juilliard, I don't know if you've heard of it, Peabody, Curtis, University of Miami. Take a while, guess how many she got into? Every single one of them. Take a while, guess where she went? University of Miami, where our maestro is director of orchestral music. Take a wild guess who the guest artist was for the Sounds of Season TV concert. Take a wild guess who one of our amazing star musicians was today, her younger sister who's going to Michigan, who also was the winner this year of the Lisa Bruna. Congratulations to you. So all of this is in your packet. I encourage you to look at it. Um, it might be some convenient reading material. If not, recycle it. You won't hurt our feelings. We have really made an impact. So the bottom line is thanks to the support of our donors, thanks to our amazing team, thanks to our board, we have now educated 50,000 kids in Palm Beach County in recent years. We've donated in the middle of COVID, thanks to Olga and Renee and the amazing team, we donated 65 instruments to Palm Beach County students in the middle of COVID. Imagine that. So that concludes my presentation. I want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share that with you. Our next concert is on November the 7th at the Kravis Center, and we'd love to have you be there. I believe that Katrina put some QR codes on the tables. Just take a picture of that, and that will take you to the website to redeem your free tickets. David, we have time for about two questions. Uh, any questions on your runner? I'll get to the mic. Any questions? Take it, Joe. Joe. 
Thank you for that nice presentation. Uh, you talked mostly about the business kinds of things. Um, talk a little bit about how you merge the business needs with the artistic community, and they don't necessarily go together. Good question, but I, I would debate that. I, I do think they go together. And I'll give you an example. So a lot of people had asked me, how are you so successful at Loggerhead? You're not a marine biologist because it's a business, right? So this is a business. So now to your point, which is a very good question about artistic excellence, is because we have people like Olga. Olga has a PhD in education. She's a classically trained pianist. Felix Rivera right here, who's been with us for six or seven years, is a composer from University of Central Florida. We were able to get Ramon Tabar after we had Ray Robinson to set the stage to take things to a whole other level with artistic excellence with Ramon. He did an amazing job. That got us to a level to where we could actually have somebody like Gerard Schwartz. So to answer your question as it relates to artistic excellence, it's Gerard Schwartz. Period. End of story. He is an absolute genius. Spent 30 years in Seattle, helped build Ben Royal Hall, the Oscar Music Orchestra, seven, seven Emmys, 14 Grammy nominations, the, the list goes on and on and on. So it is trying to integrate, and I know what you mean by the question, or at least I think I do, um, how do you integrate the two? And how you integrate the two is exactly what I said is the inverted triangle. So we have our ideas in terms of vision. I have ideas as to where I think we could take the organization. But then we engage the team. And the team will say to us, there are a lot of things that the team shuts down. I have ideas that I want to be able to go out into the community and make a difference in the community from an artistic standpoint. And they shut me down immediately. And it's because they have an artistic vision. Did that answer the question? OK. Any other questions? All right, on the other side here. Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. I'm Miller Porter from the Brew House Gallery. Um, have you had uh, or have you tried less than successful ideas and then how did you pivot from them or did you just decide, hey, we shouldn't do that again? So I love what you said. So what I like to frame it as, I don't look at failures as failures. I look at them as learning experiences and areas of opportunity. So you're basically asking me when have we failed and how did we pivot from the failures, right? There have been many. Absolutely. You know, there have been many things that we have learned along the way, that was not a very good idea. You beta test. I'm a very big believer in beta testing. But I also think to be successful in beta testing, you have to monitor the calculated risk. Very much like COVID. You know, we went into COVID, we knew it was risky. We had people telling us, you're foolish. You're going to go out and try to put on a We did not do anything different. Our entire season, last season, was the exact same season, other than I think the one guest artist, and maybe a little bit of reduction in programming. But we did all five concerts. Yeah. You know, so we did not deviate from that. Um, gosh, I think my, if you ask this question to my staff, get with them after, and they'll spend 20 minutes with you as to all of the roads that we went down that we shouldn't have gone down. Camilla? Great question. So we had an epiphany. I had an epiphany. I subscribed to Fortune magazine. In 1993, I had the pleasure of working at UBS. I worked with a gentleman by the name of Dick Toplin. Dick Toplin managed all of Wayne Huizenga's money. Waste management, Blockbuster, Miami Dolphins, Wayne Huizenga. And at the time, as we all remember, Blockbuster was the Netflix of yesterday. I think the one thing, Camilla, that we've realized is that we need to be Reed Hastings. So in the middle of the pandemic, I get Fortune Magazine. Take a wild guess who's on the front cover of Fortune Magazine. Reed Hastings. How many of you have actually gone to Blockbuster recently to get your VHS tapes? <laughs> How many of you have actually watched programs like Yellowstone? How many of you watched that? Only reason I bring that up, that was going to be one of our trick questions. Brian Tyler is a brilliant composer. If you ever watched that show, Netflix, he created all the music for that. So the one thing I think we've realized is that you have to innovate. You continuously have to innovate. The team has realized, and so has this whole entire industry, we cannot rely on only having people in seats. We have to think outside the box. Obviously, our ultimate goal is to have 2,195 people come to the Kravis Center on November 7th. But when we did the virtual concerts, we had people as far as 20 states. Maria? Yes. 20 states, four countries. We had people commenting from Italy and Colombia. Beautiful program. How can we turn our face to that? You can't, right? So you have to creatively figure out how you don't compromise the brand, you don't compromise the artistic form of this art form, 
But you have to be innovative. You don't want to become blockbuster. I know that we don't. We realize that. <coughs> no, we're running out of time. I'm sorry. Nine o'clock, we want to get, get out of here. Mm -hmm. give, give David, please, a big hand. Yeah.